Tom? A lot of preparations. Ah, good morning. It's good to see you all. Rory and Kirstine have a holiday this weekend, uh, having a break, and uh, we pray God's blessing on them. And um, Rory asked me to take the service this morning and to do the Zoom service this evening. Welcome to you all who are here and to those who are joining us on the streaming and service on uh, YouTube or however you're receiving it or on the telephone. Praise be to the Lord because he has come and has redeemed his people and has raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. May we worship God together. Let's uh, bow in prayer, shall we? Our Father, almighty, holy, and glorious, we are awed at the very thought of you. Indeed, our our minds cannot really conceive of you. We can only begin to imagine. We can only uh, take your word and try to understand it. Yet we pray that you will meet with us today and come closer to us than anyone else ever does. We pray that you will speak to us and that you will work inside us, in our minds, in our hearts, in our personalities, in all that is us. And we pray that you will change us by this service. We pray that we may bring glory to your name, but that you will be glorified by making us, sinners though we are, more like Jesus. So oh, please pardon us and help us and lead us by your Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now we're going to join in whatever way we can in uh, Psalm 147 in the Sing Psalms version. Oh, praise the Lord. How good it is to sing him songs of praise. How pleasant to give thanks to him for all his gracious ways. And then we'll uh, follow the singing on from verse 2 to verse 7. The Lord builds up Jerusalem, and he it is alone who reaches out to Israel to bring the exiles home. Israel is uh, not only the ancient Jewish people, uh, who believe in Jesus, but as Paul tells us in Galatians, whoever is of faith, Jew or Gentile, is a child of Abraham and comes under the wonderful promises of our Lord. Psalm 147, verses 2 to 7. Shall we stand?
There we are. Here's my picture. Let's come a little bit nearer the youngsters at the back and you on the way as well. See, this, this is my valuable painting. What do you think of it? Is it the, the finest picture you've ever seen? What do you think? Do you think it would be worth thousands of pounds if I took it along to a shop to sell it? What do you think? Come on, be honest. <laughs> no, there we are. The youngest one is more on. See, the older ones have got more inhibitions. <laughs> she doesn't think it's that old. What about you at the back there? The lips. How much would you give me for that? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's Mark. Who, you know, if Mark was marking me for an art exam, I don't think I'd get many, many marks for that. I wouldn't get, well, he's, he's too kind, you see. But, um, well, I'll tell you why it's the most valuable thing I have. And that is because it was done by my little boy. I forget, Sarah may remember how old, I think he was at nursery or preschool at the time. And he came home one day with this picture that he'd drawn. It's not very good, is it? I mean, the, the sea sort of goes straight up there, and the ship is very flat. There's no, there's no perspective in it. But that doesn't matter, because my boy did it, and he did it for me. He knew that I really like ships. I think I may have taken him and his sister down to Portsmouth to see HMS Victory. And he knows that that was one of my favorite places in the world. And so one day he came home from uh, nursery and shoved that at me that I've done that day. And it's wonderful. He did it for me. He did it because he knew I would like it. He was wanting to please me because he loves me. Now, don't get any illusions about my son. He was a brat. <laughs> and uh, he cost as many a sleepless night. And uh, he never would eat his carrots. And dinner times could be miserable. But he showed his love by doing this for me. Now, sometimes we talk as if, when we're Christians, we can't do anything for God. We're sinners, and everything that we do is marred by sin. We certainly cannot pay God to save us. We cannot earn the forgiveness of our sins. God gives us what we don't deserve, forgiveness. God pours his 
love on us simply because he loves us. He gives us far and beyond anything that we could imagine. When all we really deserve is his disapproval, his punishment, his anger. We know that. But when we're Christians, sometimes we forget that God wants us to do good works, good things. Now, like my son's picture, the good things that we do, whether it's uh, helping other people, uh, being involved in a charity, being involved in Christian ministry, coming to church, whether it's praying, whether it's reading the Bible and uh, sharing things with others, all these things we do are, in one sense, when you look at them, they're not worth anything. And they're full of flaws. But that's not how God sees them. When we do things for God, when we do things because God is our Father in heaven, or put it, to put it more theologically, when we do things for God because he's our dad, then God is pleased with them. And God, God is God. God is glorified. God rejoices. My friends, uh, our coming here to church today is giving something to God. God likes it when we come to church. God likes it when we are interested in the Bible. God likes it when we pay attention and learn. God likes it when we pray. And yes, all our learning, all our singing, all our humming, all our worshipping, all our knowledge is imperfect. And we fail in so many ways. But God still delights in the praises and the prayers of his people. So, boys and girls, it's good that you're here today. I hope you're here, at least in part, because you want to please God. And I hope too that, like my son, you'll do things for your mum and dad. When did you last tell your mum and dad that you love them? When did you last show them that you love them? When did you last think, I could do a picture, I could make this, because mum or dad would like that. That's a great thing to do. God is pleased with it. Our mum and dad are too. And of course, even more these days. If you've got a granddad, he'd be even more pleased. You do something for him. Let's join together and say that family prayer, the Lord's Prayer, that God gave his children to pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now we're going to read God's Word now in the book of Revelation, at the very end of the Bible. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 7. The book of Revelation is a bit like Lord of the Rings. It's a vivid, dramatic story with lots of picture language, lots of symbolic things described uh, to teach us spiritual truths, real truths, real ways in which God is going to work. And we have to see behind some of the picture language and the events and to see what God is doing, what God is going to do. Revelation 20 from verse 7. 
when the thousand years, that's probably the whole time between the coming of Jesus uh, on earth and when Jesus returns at the end of the world. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to, get, to gather them for battle. In number they are like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They would be tormented day and night, forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which, was, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Amen. May God bless his word to us. Let's bow again in prayer as we bring our, our needs to God. Heavenly Father, who in your mercy forgives us our sins when we confess our sins to you, have mercy on us this day. Pardon us from all the things that we have done this past week, and even this day, that offend you, which break your holy law, which fall short of your glory. Forgive us the things that we have not done that we ought to have done. Forgive us the imperfect way that we have done even the good deeds, like worshipping you, like praying, like reading your word, like uh, encouraging and uh, caring for one another. Lord, cleanse our whole lives by the blood of Jesus Christ who gave his life as a sacrifice to take the punishment that our sins deserved upon himself and offers us free pardon and everlasting righteousness. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We pray that we may know him and realise our, our need of him more and more each day. We pray that by your Holy Spirit we may become more like him. As we do pray and read your word and hear it preached, as we share with one another as Christians, as we uh, walk together with you, Heavenly Father, make us holy, make us good, make us fruitful, in your service. We pray your blessing on all the ministries of your church around the world. We thank you that your church is involved in so much 
in the way of charity, of relief, medical care, of programs for social justice. We ask, oh God, that you will help your church to do all these things for your glory. We pray your blessing on Blyswood and all the other Christian ministries that we know of in this area. We pray too for the direct gospel ministry of your church. We pray for the translation, for the spreading, for the preaching of your word among the nations. We pray for those who are training for Christian ministry and Christian service. We pray for all who are leaders in your church, uh, ministers, pastors and teachers, deacons and carers, family workers, um, house group leaders, um, those who teach in Sunday schools. We pray, O oh Lord, for all the men and women whom you use, whose gifts you supply, and whose work you use in building your church and kingdom. We thank you for Christian parents and their work in their families. We thank you for Christians teaching in schools. We thank you for Christian policemen and Christian businessmen, for Christians in every sphere of life. And we ask, oh God, that as you have called us to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, that you will give us a real heart for the people around us who do not yet know Jesus. We pray that we may be moved with compassion as Jesus was when he saw the multitudes. And may all of us do whatever work it is you've given us to do in this world. May we do it eagerly for you and for the good of men and women around us. We pray, Heavenly Father, in these continuing days of the COVID and virus, that you will watch over our nation and all the nations of the world. We pray for those who are sick at this time, and in your mercy you will heal them, blessing the efforts of doctors and nurses, and as vaccines become available, we pray that uh, they may be widely spread and made available in all nations. And uh, under your blessing, may they bring deliverance from the fear and the darkness and the suffering of this virus. We pray for our rulers and all with authority in government and in medical services and so on, that they may have wisdom to know how to act. And we pray that you will bless and where necessary overrule their actions, that uh, your cause and the cause of good and peace and righteousness may prevail in the world. We pray for the suffering of this world that is not related to COVID. We pray for those who are ill with other diseases. We pray for those who are caught up in war and violence. Those who live in places where crime abounds and where uh, powerful evil influences are at work among young people uh, especially we pray for those who live in the impoverished estates of our cities we pray for those who are caught up in all the dangers of gangs and of, of drug uh, trade and so on we pray for the young people and others who are heavily influenced by negative aspects of social media for those who are uh, ridiculed and bullied, for those who are pressured even to suicide. And we ask, oh God, that you will have mercy upon the young people of our land and every land. And we pray, our God, that you will cause uh, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ to advance. May King Jesus ride forth like a uh, the figure on the white horse in the book of Revelation, conquering and to conquer, not by military might, not by killing people, but by saving them, not by inflicting pain and hardship, but by bringing peace and new life through the Holy Spirit. And may that be our experience as we commit ourselves with all our individual needs 
those who mourn, those who are worn down by these long months of lockdown and isolation, those who are fearful, those who are concerned at other matters. Oh Lord, you know our hearts. <coughs> Bring us your peace this day. Speak to us through your word. Minister to us by your Holy Spirit. And bring glory to your name. We pray it all with thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'd like to uh, preach you this morning on words that we find in Matthew chapter 6. Some of you will recall that in uh, over the past months, one gets a very vague sense of how time is passing. But last January, before COVID, seems a world away, does it? An age away. But sometime in the past, I preached a few sermons to you on the Lord's Prayer. And I thought today I would preach on um, the last petition of the Lord's Prayer. You'll find it in Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. Well, let's. We've said the Lord's Prayer together, and in chapter 13, in verse 13 of chapter 6, it says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Or, deliver us from evil. If you know your shorter catechism very well, you'll know that the, that and many other books of Christian teaching number the petitions and many of them, most of them perhaps, say that in verse 13 we have the sixth petition, the sixth request of the Lord's Prayer. And that request, they, they say, is, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, or deliver us from the evil. Both translations are quite positive. We'll say a bit more about that later. But most books, like the Shorter Catechism, take these two statements of verse 13 as one petition. They are closely connected. But I wanted us to look at the second part of it. This is a separate item. Lead us not into temptation is a prayer of God's sheep. Lord, you do lead us. But Lord, don't lead us into places where we face temptation to sin. Why? What does that request reveal? It reveals that the Christian knows their weakness. Lord, don't lead us into temptation because we know we are so vulnerable. We so easily fall into sin. As the letter to the Hebrews says, sin so easily entangles us. So Father, please, as you lead us, as you overrule everything, please Please lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from evil. Well, if we fall into sin through temptation, that is evil and it is the evil one. But I think this last petition is talking about more than just my temptation to commit a sin. It's actually looking beyond my immediate temptation, my immediate sins, to something distinct. Evil. The evil one. It's looking more broadly, and it's looking more distantly. It's looking beyond the present. The Lord's Prayer uh, is very aware that we live for today. Give us today our daily bread. And that reflects the fact that as human beings, you know, we, we live a day at a time. We have daily pressures. We may be um, concerned in how we feel today, how we slept or didn't sleep last night. Uh, something we've got to do today. And Jesus says in the in the Sermon on the Mount where the Lord's Prayer is set, Jesus says, oh, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Today is enough to be getting on with. Sufficient unto the day and its are its troubles. It's not wrong to be concerned for today. 
We need forgiveness for our sins. We need daily bread. And Jesus wants us every day to be consciously dependent on him. But our problem as human beings is that we tend to be concerned only for today. We tend to live with our, as I say, with our nose to the ground. And we're not seeing the longer view. We're not seeing the bigger picture. Yes, Jesus said, do be concerned for the day. But I think in these words he says we should pray, deliver us from the evil one. As we'll see, Jesus is saying, but look beyond today. Look as far as you can see. In fact, look, look farther than you've ever looked before. The book of Proverbs tells us that the wise man does look ahead. Uh, there is lots of verses in Proverbs which are, say things like, well, um, uh, the, the, the person who, who's got a drink problem, they see uh, a glass of wine and they can't resist it. And they want to drink it and lots more glasses of wine. And they don't think of the hangover they'll have tomorrow. They don't think of the trouble and the, the uh, mess-ups that drinking and being drunk will get them into. All they can think about is that right now they're thirsty. The wise man looks ahead and thinks, what's going to be the outcome of this? What are going to be the unintended consequences of this? And it sums it up in Proverbs 16 with a statement that says, there is a way that looks good to a man, but the end is death. There's something that looks like a good idea, but the eventual outcome, the paper, is disaster. Wisdom looks around. And you know, in everyday life, we know that too. The farmer doesn't say, oh, I need some barley to feed my cows today. I'll go and plant some seeds, and then um, an hour later I'll dig it up, and there'll be plenty for the cows to eat. No, the farmer plans ahead. There's a time to plant, and then that seed has to be nurtured and uh, guarded and watered and so on until the right time comes for it to be sown. The Bible talks about the builder who plans to build a city and make sure that he's got enough resources to pay for it. And then a builder orders the various uh, materials that you need and plans how long it will take. In the Bible, there's a great example of this in the story of Joseph. Do you remember in Egypt, when Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dream, he was put in charge of all of Egypt's resources because the dream said, there's a famine coming, but first, there'll be years of plenty. And so Joseph gathered in the bunk of crops of those first seven years, so that when the famine came, there was food enough for Egypt and others in Joseph's warehouses. We need to live today, have our eyes on where our feet are today, but also we need to be looking ahead some people, of course, look ahead and see nothing but real problems. Along with the COVID, I suppose the big thing that causes people anxiety today is the environment. Global warming, rising sea levels, uh, pollution of the oceans, the melting of the Arctic ice cap. Um, that's a real concern. And what we do now will have an influence on the future. And what can we do now? Isn't it worrying? Uh, all this talk <coughs> about the environment. And what about disease? You know, COVID seems to have jumped from an animal population into the human population. 
And with human population uh, growing with big cities and people settling in the jungles of Brazil and the, the jungles of China and other places, uh, they tell us that there'll be more and more viruses jumping across from animals into humans. Isn't it frightening? What may COVID-29 be like if COVID-19 is like this? And what about trends in politics? Did you see uh, President Obama being interviewed this week about his new book and using that uh, very memorable phrase that our society is suffering from truth decay. Truth decay. Uh, lies are accepted. People can be caught out lying and they just brazen out of it. Uh, there was a time when telling a lie was considered um, totally dishonourable. Now he said we're suffering from truth decay. What do you feel when you do look ahead? Well, the Lord's Prayer finishes with a look ahead prayer, with a long view prayer. Lord, it says, deliver us from evil. There are these things, some of them are maybe immediate. If you were in prison today being tortured, it would be very hard for you to see beyond that present injustice and pain and suffering. But if you're concerned about the environment, if you're concerned about diseases, if you're discerned, concerned about the breakdown of the family, of the increasing drug abuse, those other things that we were praying for among children. If you're concerned about the future, then you need to pray this prayer. Deliver us from evil. This is really, stand back a little from it, deliver us from evil or from the evil one. This is a prayer that in a way is the theme of the whole Bible. Go back almost to the beginning of the Bible. And uh, Israel are slaves in Egypt. And they're crying out to God because Pharaoh and the Egyptians are ruthlessly uh, maltreating them and uh, grinding them down. And in Exodus chapter 6 and verse uh, 5, um, God says, no, chapter 6, verse 6, Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will deliver you from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. God says to the people of Israel, I will deliver you from the evil of Egypt. And then uh, the great story of the Exodus starts, takes place. What is it? But the story of how God delivered Israel from Egypt and brought them into the promised land. Then you find the cries of God's people uh, throughout the Old Testament, one that we sing very often. Psalm 130, uh, Lord, uh, you know, we're sinners. If you should mark iniquity, who could stand? Lord, um, if you punish us, we're lost. We will be destroyed. But Lord, we wait for you. We wait for your mercy. And then that wonderful word that comes at the end of, of Psalm 130, the Lord shall redeem and the word deliver and the word redeem are very closely entwined. The Lord will deliver Israel from all his iniquity. There is hope of a deliverance of a deliverer. That verse with which we began the, uh, the service today from uh, Zechariah's song when John the Baptist was born. Uh, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel for he has visited and redeemed his people. The Lord has visited, the Lord has come. Now is the time that God is going to act. And my Lord John the Baptist, he says, 
He's going to go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. Jesus came to bring deliverance to God's people. The early Christians realised this when we uh, read perhaps the earliest, possibly the earliest letter in the New Testament, the earliest part of the New Testament to be written. It's the first letter to the Thessalonians. Paul says to the Thessalonian Christians, look, um, people have been hearing about your new faith. They've heard that you have turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the coming wrath, from the day when all sin will be fully punished when all that is anti-God, when all that is evil will be destroyed. The wrath, Paul calls it. Um, and he says, to, he says, he writes in his letter, look, that's what a Christian is. Somebody who is waiting for Jesus, for he delivers us from evil. He, he, just, he delivers us from wrath. And then, as we saw in Revelation, the end of the Bible is this great story. But what happens at the end? Does Jesus just take out his people here, one here, one there, a few there, and say, well, yeah, okay, let, let's do all this. Let's, let's um, you come and we'll, we'll try and live somewhere nicer. No, actually, all the evil that has been in the world will be dealt with. All that is evil, even death, will be cast into that lake of fire. It's symbolic language, but it means it will be utterly removed from God's presence and from the presence of God's people. What Revelation 21 is telling us in Revelation 20 in those vivid language, all, all that is evil, all that is hostile, all that is a burden and a problem to God's people and God's cause will be removed and they will be in the unmitigated, unlimited enjoyment of God and his presence. And over Revelation 20 and 21, you could write these words, God will deliver us from evil and from the evil one. So that's really what the Bible is all about, from Exodus to Revelation, from Genesis to Revelation. It's about the problem of evil, the reality of evil, and God delivering us from evil through Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. So this petition really plugs us or, or lights up the whole Bible, the whole Bible, the whole message that we should learn about what God has been doing in this world, what God is doing today, and what God will do. It's a wonderful, it's a vital petition. But before you pray it eagerly and earnestly, you need to understand and believe two things that don't come naturally to us. These two things are, one, that evil is as real and as serious as the Bible says. And number two is that God will eventually deliver his people from all evil as the Bible promises. I'll look very quickly at those two and then draw some threads. We need to be clear. We need to accept. We need to recognize that evil is as real and as serious as the Bible says. Back at the beginning of the Bible, there's the key chapter of Genesis 3, what we call the fall of man. Adam and Eve made perfect, enjoying a perfect environment, enjoying a perfect spiritual relationship with God, and enjoying good, a perfect relationship with each other and with the creation. And it all goes wrong in Genesis 3. Genesis 3 says, look, this is where things went wrong. This is the root of all the trouble in the world. 
Genesis 3 tells us there is an evil power active in the world. This mysterious figure who comes to them as the serpent, who tempts them into rejecting and abandoning their trust in God's word and listening to him instead. We can call him Satan. We can call him the devil. We can call him the evil one. And that may be a, a direct reference to the evil one in this petition of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, there is an evil being within this universe. Evil is real and active. But then Genesis 3 also tells us that human sin, human rejection, human rebellion against God, human uh, rejection of God's word and God's veracity is the root cause of all the disaster that happened. When evil one gained his way with and he didn't you know, hit them and put some microbe in them that led them astray. What the evil one does in Genesis 3 is to undermine their confidence in God's word. Yea, has God said? And then he calls God a liar. You shall not surely die if you eat as God has forbidden you to. God said if you eat of that tree, you will die. And the devil says to them, God's a liar. And that, it says, is the root of all the trouble in the world. Human beings have stopped believing God, stopped obeying God. Genesis 3 tells us the evil affects uh, our relationships, our lives. Adam and Eve uh, start blaming each other. Uh, it, it affects their psychology. They believe they are naked. They, they see that they are naked and they are ashamed. Um, Tim Keller, a New York preacher, loves to point or points out when he's preaching on Genesis that uh, if you want any proof of this, just think how you react when somebody shows you a, a picture in which you're in, a group of you with the children or you with your friends. Who's the first person you look at in that picture? And what do you most of the time say, oh, don't I look dreadful in that picture? How strange we are. How strangely vulnerable to our self-perception of what others think of. Well, I don't even knew that they were naked. It changed human psychology. We read soon afterwards that their son killed his brother. It brought evil and disruption into the human family. But it affected more than human society. It affected the very environment that we live, live in. Thorns and thistles were brought forth. And it brought death into the world. Many people don't like what the Bible says about evil. Some have religious roots. Buddhists, for instance, say that no, all evil is an illusion. It's not real. It's, it's an Christian scientists say there's no such thing as pain. It, it's an illusion. You must, uh, you know, you, it's just your mind playing tricks on you. There's no such thing as evil. That's not a view the Bible takes. The Bible says, you know, you, have, you, you hurt when somebody does these things to you. You hurt when you've got a disease. You hurt when people betray you. Evil is real in this world. There are some people who deny COVID. There's no such thing as COVID. It's all a plot. And people love to say evil is an illusion. But it's not. Christians face reality. Other people say that um, Evil is uh, an outdated concept that has uh, been grossly exaggerated. Beginning of the 20th century, year 1900, uh, a woman called Beatrice Webb 
said that there is no problem facing the human race today that it is beyond the powers of an enlightened science to cure or prevent. I don't think anybody, uh, let alone a scientist, at the end of the twenty, at the beginning of the twenty-first century, would say that evil is in this world. This last week, people commemorating the seventy-fifth anniversary of the beginning of the Nuremberg trials, and there in Nuremberg. That world of Beatrice and Sidney Webb, her husband, had to face the fact that there were greater evils in the world than the human race had ever faced up to before. And so the Nuremberg trials of the leading Nazis created new legal categories of um, ethnic cleansing, if you like, of mass murder, of seeking to annihilate whole sections of the human race. Evil that we've not accepted or realised before. Writing during the Second World War, a man called Walter Lippmann said, The modern sceptical world has been taught for some 200 years a conception of human nature in which the reality of evil has been discounted us. It's an age, an environment of easy optimism that we can scarcely know what people meant when they talked about Satan and evil. We should have to recover this forgotten but essential truth, along with so many others that we lost when, thinking we were enlightened and advanced, we were merely shallow and blind. My friends, you need to be living a particularly sheltered and comfortable life to deny the reality of evil in human beings. Yes, during the COVID environment and COVID virus, lots of people displayed great generosity to their neighbours. Lots of people displayed great sacrificial labour in the health service and so on. But Nobody's denying that goodness. Christians admire and love the beauty of God's creation. We delight in the joy of fellowship and family life and all these things. But we say that, that in this strange and mysteriously fallen world, that does not preclude, that doesn't mean that there is no evil in the world. There is greed. Every day our papers seem to be full. Uh, some scandal or other, some company that has made £250 million pounds out of the COVID uh, PPE business. Um, corruption, lust, selfishness, hatred, racism is alive and kicking. 150, 160 odd years ago in America, there was a civil war of which Abraham Lincoln at the end got a great proclamation up that the slaves were free, slavery was ended. But this year has shown that bitter racism and terrible discrimination is still rampant in many parts of American society and other societies too. Did you hear this week again talking of anniversaries? The anniversary, it wasn't an anniversary, but the death of the Yorkshire River. How can people do those things if we're all basically good? And then think of um, those mobile phones in your pockets. Isn't IT a wonderful thing? Isn't it fantastic that we can have Zoom and be together during lockdown? But whoever invented or discovered or put together IT did they really mean for it to be used for people uh, hacking into our bank accounts? Did they really mean it so that young people could bully each other online? So that people could post uh, graphic descriptions of how to kill yourself? Did they use it so that uh, 
you know, whole courses, of, did they develop it so that whole courses of election, even wars, could be provoked by the lies of it? No, they didn't mean that. And the technology isn't evil, but the people who use it are. Evil is as real as the Bible says. And then, as we've seen, the Bible promises that God will deliver his people from all evil. I cover that, I suppose. That's what the Bible says. Yes, there is evil. Yes, we suffer. As Christians suffer too. Yes, there is evil within the church. And we hear from time to time of scandals within the church and great failures within the church. The Bible never says the church is perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. But the Bible assures us that God will deliver us from all evil. This prayer, then, let me, let me just say these things a sentence and tell me, this evening, if you join us on Zoom, we'll look a bit more at this. This prayer calls you to face up to reality. You can't really pray the Lord's Prayer unless you face up to reality. Do you remember the story of the prodigal son? There he was in a far country, uh, still no thought of going home to his father. And where, where had he got to? He was in a pig sty. And he would happily have eaten the husks that the pigs were fed. Is the guy mad? What's he doing there? And the Bible has a telling phrase. It says, when he came to his senses, when he came to himself, he said, I'm not the slave. The slaves in my father's house better off than me. I'll go home. Have you come to your senses? Have you looked at this world, all the pain and anxieties and whatever that you face? Have you woken up and said, you know, that old book is correct. The Bible tells us about evil. Pray, Lord, open my eyes. Show me my need. And show me that I need to come home to you. May God bless his word to us. Now we're going to sing a closing hymn now. And it's, uh, there is a higher throne, and all this world has known it's, If you find Mission Praise at home, it's number 1116, but the words should be on the screen. There is a higher throne. Should we stand to sing?
word, you will open our eyes to see the reality that is around us and to see how wonderful is what you promise us in your word. Oh Lord, open our eyes to see these wonderful things. Open our hearts to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as he is offered to us in the gospel. And shape our desires so that our greatest ambition in life may be to grow in the knowledge and experience and love of Jesus Christ. That this earth may be filled with the glory of God. That your love and your truth may heal the hurts of this suffering world. And all glory may come to you. We pray this for ourselves and for your whole church and for all the nations on earth. So may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, rest upon you and remain with you always.